Hello, let's continue our verse-by-verse -verse teaching moving through the book of Acts. We're in chapter 19, and we're going to be getting into some pretty spiritual stuff today and talking a little bit about the dangers of signs and wonders and some things to be aware of. I know that there's a lot of uh, movements even in the church today that are really centered around signs and wonders. So we want to be clear on what the Bible really teaches on these things. Um, this can be an appealing thing, but it can also be a dangerous thing. Now, in the first seven verses of this chapter, Paul is uh, runs into these believers in Ephesus, and they hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit, and they're baptized again upon hearing, you know, the fullness of the gospel, I guess you'd say, and uh, and they're baptized again, and they receive the Holy Spirit, and that's kind of where we left off. So we'll pick it up in verse eight here. It says. And, and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left him, left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Um, so this is really strange. Uh, these unusual miracles by the hands of Paul that are being done, and there's handkerchiefs or aprons that are being brought to the sick and those who are afflicted by spirits. Now, the first thing I would like to highlight and point out about this is the word unusual. And as incredible as these miracles are, they were not commonplace for that time or any time. The word for unusual is itself a very unusual word. And it's in fact a negative word like no or not. It is a, a negative word in the Greek that word that's translated unusual. And I looked at several different English translations, and some say, you know, extraordinary uh, miracles were done or, or whatever, uh, special or unusual. And in regard to the kinds of miracles that God was doing by the hand of Paul, uh, they were extraordinary. They were unusual. But being that the word is a negative, I would say that God was doing works through Paul that he normally would not do. It's like saying, uh, when something happens, go saying that never happens. The miracles that Paul were doing are like miracles that never happen. That that's probably the most accurate English, <laughs> accurate way to translate that. Not that I'm a Greek expert or anything like that. Um, why was God doing these unusual works through the hands of Paul? And and I I do highlight the fact that this was unusual and not something God normally did. Handkerchiefs and items that are being passed to sick people and and they're being healed. And, and I really want to point that out because there's plenty of guys that are, you know, have been on TV or have these, you know, prophetic ministries or healing ministries or whatever that are like, you know, send me a thousand dollars and I'll send you a little, you know, piece of cloth, a healing cloth or a prayer shawl or some item, you know, as if they, uh, you know, could, could endow that from God himself. Um, I just would like to point out, it says this was unusual. It was not something God normally did. Now, why did God do it at this time? And it's perhaps to place his own personal stamp on the Apostle Paul that we might know today that he had a special calling from God, a special ministry. He was a special guy. And it always amazes me to see these people out there that are trying to discount the Apostle Paul. And this is a thing, too, that you'll run into where people were like, well, you know, They'll try and say Paul didn't agree with Jesus or that Paul was heretical or whatever. And if you ever hear someone say that Paul was heretical or that he spoke words that are contrary to Jesus, just run the other way, okay? Um, because right then and there, there's a serious problem with their view of the scriptures. Um, only people who would, only people who do not take the Bible serious or hold it as authoritative would say something like that. Uh, about the Apostle Paul. Now, he wasn't perfect. He wasn't a perfect man, but were his words that he re that are written and recorded, were they inspired? Were they God-breathed, theonoustos, like it tells us in 2 Timothy, and so on? 
Um, have they been supernaturally preserved by God down through the ages for us to have and to learn from? Are they profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work? And the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. So if somebody tries to discount the words of Paul, they're discounting the entirety of the scripture. It is a direct denial of what the Bible claims to be. So anyone trying to disparage Paul is themselves unbiblical. Um, and that's not to say that Paul was perfect, because he certainly was not. And even in, throughout the book of Acts, we'll see that there were, you know, Paul got in, in conflicts with certain people, um, even other believers. And we'll see that there are, you know, potential big decisions that Paul made that, that maybe were not correct, okay? So Paul wasn't like sinless, you know, he's not like Jesus, but the things that he instructed, like the churches, the epistle letters, I mean, this is the best doctrine that we have for this stuff. God has clearly preserved it for us to, uh, for our learning for today. So we're not going to deify Paul either, but the things he wrote were most definitely inspired by God, as the scripture claims. Carrying on verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. So a lot to digest there. Itinerant Jewish exorcists. These guys were traveling around, casting out demons and things of that nature. Um, and they would say, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Um, that's interesting. So also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? And then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped upon them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Now notice, even the bad things that happen can be used by God, and they can point to the power of Christ and our need for Christ, and God uses those bad instances as well as the good. We see this throughout the book of Acts, but what a bizarre passage this is. But I, I just point that out because it ends in saying, they were fearful. People in the region were fearful, but the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified through this odd, bizarre event. And we must remember, too, that this is here for our learning. These seven sons of Sceva had seen or heard of the power of God working through Paul, and they wanted to do it, too. Um, that's not unreasonable. I mean, I, I think that makes sense. It's just like the handkerchief thing and, and, you know, modern day evangelists and stuff wanting to do similar things. This is nothing new. We also saw this with uh, Simon the Sorcerer earlier in the book of Acts and, and so on with, with Peter. Um, so these guys are, are basically trying to copycat Paul to some extent. And, and they're attempting to cast out spirits in Christ's name through Paul. And it doesn't go well for them at all. What's the real issue here? Well, I think there are several key issues that we can learn uh, in this text that are exceptionally important for us to understand. Number one, signs can be deceiving, okay? Matthew chapter six verse or 16, verse four, Jesus says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah, and he left them and departed. And I actually have a video on the sign of the prophet Jonah, or what is the sign of Jonah that you can look up as well. And a lot of people have questions about that, but that's another, that's another discussion for a different time. Our point being this, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. That's what Jesus says. So we're not to have some unhealthy attraction to signs and wonders ministries. It's not to say that we don't believe in them. Um, I, I think any Bible-believing Christian will pray for someone who is sick and, and pray that they'll be healed and different things of that nature. And, and depending on their view of the scriptures, I know some people are cessationalists and they don't believe in the gifts anymore. Um, but a lot of believers 
today, you know, embrace the gifts as well, supernatural gifts and so on. Um, I certainly believe in the gifts personally. Um, but it's not to be the central focus, okay, of, of our lives in Christ Jesus, okay? And there's even warnings about this concerning the future, like in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verses 9 through 12. It's talking about the Antichrist in these verses, and it says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, I, I have to point it out, even before I read the rest of this, what's the issue here? The lawless one, which is, a, which is the title of the Antichrist, is going to come with all unrighteous deception, and he's going to do this through lying signs and wonders, with, with power, signs, and wonders. So if you are um, overly interested in the signs and wonders, if you're uh, really drawn to that thing, this is a warning, okay? Maybe you are in a church that's just all about the sign gifts, like all the time, all channels all the time. That could prove to be a real stumbling block in the end time scenario with the things that are coming upon the earth. Um, this guy that shows up on the scenes, he's going to be a signs and wonders guy, and he's going to deceive the world through those things. And, and it contrasts that, that he's going to, uh, he's, he's according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because, why do they perish? Why are they deceived? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And it says, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Heaping up for themselves, right? Teachers, with the, you know, to tell them what their itching ears want to hear, because they did not receive the love of the truth. And you have to ask yourself, and I'll ask you, do you really love the truth? Because if you're more enamored with signs and wonders than you are with biblical truth and authority, you're going to be deceived by those things at some point in time. It's going to lead you astray. Leads me into point number two, where Jesus tells us it was never supposed to be about the signs and wonders to be the main focus. And uh, point two, I'll just call rejoice not in the power. Luke chapter 10, verse 19 Jesus says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That power, power in general, is a deceptive thing, and our flesh longs for powerful, uh, for power and to be powerful. So this can be contrary to the childlike faith and dependence that God is trying to produce in our lives. When it's in our weakness, God's power shows up in our lives. When we come to God in, in faith and in dependence and we look to him to be the solution to our problems, that's when God's power is most on display in our lives. And so rejoice not in the power, although that's a real thing. Um, that, that, that's given to us in Scripture. But don't seek after the power. Don't rejoice in, in these things that God will do through you, in you, and through you. Always embrace that with humility and never become over, overly enamored with the signs and wonders, the giftings, the, um, you know, even exorcism like these guys were. Number three, there is an issue here of personal identity. Point number three is just personal identity. There is no power or authority without the personal relationship with Christ. Without the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwelling within a person, there is no power or it's not true power. Jesus also told us in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he is sort of the authority when it comes to power, isn't he? But you shall receive power, he says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Um, the purpose for the, the power comes from God. It comes from his spirit. And the purpose for the power is to be his witness 
to the world around you. The purpose for the power is not so that you can look spiritual in front of other Christians. It's not so that you can do tricks in church. It's not so that you can feel powerful when you pray for someone or any of those things. It is to be his witness in the world around you. And if we're seeking after signs and miracles and wonders and all of these things, and it's not for the purpose of being witnesses, then we're not trying to do it for the reason that Jesus told us he would give us the power. So they were uh, claiming Christ's authority and trying to somehow channel that through Paul or something, these sons of Sceva, um, which really leads us to the final point, which is point number four on signs and wonders, Jesus plus nothing, okay? The Apostle Paul was a great man of God. And I just, you know, I gave my opinion on, on Paul and my defense of him, about him, and, and that he had a special calling. God put his stamp on him and all of that stuff. But this is a Jesus plus nothing equation when it comes to the power of God. In other words, Jesus doesn't need anyone else's name attached to his for his power to manifest. And, and if anything, any name that gets attached to him is detracting from the power. That's what we see happen with the seven sons here uh, in this passage. They were a Jesus they didn't truly know and have a relationship with, and then kind of through Paul, this Jesus whom Paul preaches. And it, it, like, that didn't work. Like, that's not going to fly. You need to have the direct connection. You need to be indwelt by the Spirit of God and receive him and, and not rely on your own strength or your own power. Like, you can do nothing of yourself, but through Christ and through his Spirit and through the power of God then miraculous things can happen, and they really can happen. Philippians 2, verse 9 uh, through 11, Therefore God also has exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is where the power is. That's the name that's above every other name. Continuing on in Acts, verse 18. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. And also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. And so we end our text today with a good old-fashioned book burning, all right? This event appeared to inspire people to do away with anything associated with magic or evil practices or anything like that, which honestly, Old Testament and New is, is really consistent. There's things that we should be leery of, that we should stay away from. Um, this could apply to certain music. It could apply to certain books, horoscopes, uh, psychics mediums, transcendental meditation, any type of communication with the dead, Eastern mysticism, which would include certain yoga practices. These are all things that as Christians, we really should have nothing to do with and just do away with those things entirely. Um, some of those things may be trivial, right? And we see the example of this stuff in the early church and throughout the scriptures, and yet somehow it gets trivialized in our culture today and not taken seriously. Uh, so I want to end with this just to sort of emphasize the seriousness of this. I think there's a, a principle that we find in Joshua chapter 7 that really brings it all home for us as far as understanding how important it really is to get the spiritual garbage out of our lives, okay? Have no other gods than, than the one true and living God and his son, Jesus Christ. That's it. We don't want anything beside him, anything coupled with him. It plagued Israel throughout their history in the Old Testament. We see, um, we see it in the early church. Uh, spiritual things are real. And so in Joshua chapter 7, we read about Israel falling in battle to their enemies at Ai. And this is right after the great victory that they had in Jericho. And we're told in chapter 7 that the Lord's anger burned against them because they had taken some of the devoted or accursed things. Uh, this was Achan's sin. He kept evil plunder and God's anger burned against them. And Joshua was unaware of what had happened. And so in verse 6, it says, then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. 
he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And, and Joshua said, Alas, Lord, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what, what will you do for your great name? And it's just like, you can hear the distress in Joshua, right? Um, God was supposed to be giving all their enemies over to them. Um, he had already given them that land and they were just going it into to possess it, right? So what's going on? And he's just beside himself. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things or the devoted things and have, stole, have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. You got that? They took the accursed things. They had these devoted things in their midst, and they could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. Because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. I hope you're getting that. There's junk that's in our houses and our homes and our minds and our that our eyes are, are looking at every day. It's got to go. You're not going to stand against the enemy until these things are gone. So let's deal with it. It says, In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to the families. And the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. And then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. Um, yeah, that's pretty serious. I would say that that sounds pretty serious to me. And I hope it's something that you take serious as well as I try to apply that to my life. Are there things in your life that need to go and you know it it isn't trivial it doesn't matter what our culture thinks even what our how our church culture treats just treats certain things it's important it was it was an issue in joshua's day it was an issue during the early church and it is just as important for us today let's not be deceived by by signs and wonders and, and be led astray by those things or other spiritual practices. And really this whole latter half of this chapter really highlights those issues strongly for us. So let's not make it trivial. Let's take it seriously and let's come before the Lord with it right now together. Father, thank you so much for your word of truth, Lord. We know that it's not to, uh, to kill our joy, Lord, that you want to remove these things from our life. It's to bring us joy. It's not so that we feel restricted or bound, but it's to bring us into greater freedom and greater fellowship with you through the removal of certain things and practices from our lives, Lord God. Help us not to be overly drawn and enamored by um, spiritual power and spiritual things, Lord, except for the things of your spirit and the fruit of your spirit, Lord God. And, and may we be drawn to that. And may you instill in each one of us, Lord, the love of the truth, the truth that brings about freedom in your life, the truth that is Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.